get some people uh, jumping on and joining us, but uh, what do you think guys want to go ahead and, and start getting into it? Yeah, okay. So we'll go ahead and, and start. Richard Jones, I see you don't have a mic or camera. Thank you for being here anyway. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, let's see, we'll go ahead and get started. We'll start off with welcome and introduction. So welcome, thank you all for being here today for our webinar, um, an introduction to the uh, Natural Hazards Resiliency uh, Assessment Tool that we are here to, to tell you a little bit more about. Um, just a couple of announcements to begin. You should have seen a notice that we are recording this. Um, just if anyone can't be with us today, we could share that with them um, and also use this for kind of note taking. Um, I did want to make everyone aware that if you would like to view captions, you can do so in Teams by clicking the little dot, dot, dot more and selecting turn on captions. Um, we're going to go ahead and just do introductions of kind of the working group, the working team that's uh, put together this assessment. Um, and then we would also ask that participants, if you would please introduce yourself in the chat, um, just your name, your organization or community that you're with, um, and, you know, perhaps your title so we know kind of what lens you're coming from. Uh, myself, I am Jen Birchfield. I'm the Natural Resource Planner with uh, Northwestern Indiana Regional Planning Commission, or NERPC. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce the rest of the NERPC team, or, or maybe allow you to introduce yourselves. Kathy, you want to introduce yourself? Um, my name is Kathy, and I'm the Director of Environmental Programs here at NERPC. And Iman. Oh, Iman is muted. Yes, I'm Iman Ibrahim. I'm a planning manager here at NERPC. I'm helping the team with the land use portion of the assessment. Yep, and I would also like to thank some other NERPC staff who are on. We have Kevin, um, who is helping us out today with recording, and we have Floor, who is helping us out with setting up the Teams meeting and kind of the technical aspects. Um, with that, uh, Joe, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Joe Axel. I work for the Indiana Department of Natural Resources, Lake Michigan Coastal Program, uh, where I serve as a Coastal Resources Coordinator. Thanks, Jen. Yep. OK, so we'll moving right along. We will I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, repeat that if participants who have just joined us, if you would please introduce yourself in the chat, your name, your community or affiliation and your title, that would be very helpful. But we'll go ahead and get right into the content. Uh, Joe, first on our agenda is kind of going over the purpose of the resiliency self assessment. Would you like to kick that off? Sure. So the overall purpose of this project is uh, the self assessment is to assist the Lake Michigan Coastal Program in identifying, uh, developing, and delivering technical resources that are most needed by our coastal communities and counties to reduce or prevent uh, uh, natural hazard risks. Uh, the assessment is also intended to help local governments evaluate potential impacts of natural hazards and consider planning and mitigation actions to increase resilience. Resilience in the context of this self-assessment tool is the ability to respond, withstand, and adapt to the impacts of natural hazard risks. The self-assessment is not a complete vulnerability assessment, nor is it intended to rank communities against each other. Rather, it's an exercise to help communities consider actions that can build uh, their resilience to natural hazard events, while also informing the coastal program enhancement strategies. Yep, thanks, Joe. And um, Iman, also part of kind of the purpose of the resiliency. Um, would you like to go ahead and, and share your slides? Okay, just a second. And I do have them. I'm trying up to get the right one. Oh, gotcha. Can you see there you it? Go. Yes, we can see it. Mm -hmm. OK, so uh, since we are doing the assessment, 
First, again, I'm Iman Ibrahim, helping the team with the uh, land use uh, portion of the plan. But like we thought, it would be a good idea just to go over uh, the, the, the natural hazards impact in Northwest Indiana. We all uh, experience a flooding issue and erosion issues, but I think just a quick reminder uh, for all of us to see, you know, the, the negative impact of the natural uh, hazards. Um, so first, we I'm, I'm going to highlight the impacts of the flooding here and uh, what's the negative impacts that caused or brought by the heavy rains, which can cause economic loss. Uh, significant cost of billions of dollars uh, just to fix the damages. Uh, the other impact is floods can displace families from their homes. Of course, it has a negative impact on agriculture, uh, economies when they are uh, drowning crops and prevent also access to public health if people in case of emergency and they want it or they got injured and they wanted to just reach the hospitals. So that's all causing by heavy rains uh, flooding. It, it also threatens our uh, public health, which is exposing individual to, uh, of course, the toxic and waterborne diseases and the dangerous debris that's coming out of the flooding. Uh, some people, they, when they got injured or they lost a loved one, uh, they, they just go through mental disorders, and that's also uh, consequences of the uh, flooding. Uh, it aggravates racial and socioeconomic inequities, and that's happening specifically when we have flooding in a poor area or rural area. Uh, or uh, specifically uh, environmental justice area. Some of the rural area or this area, they don't have a good uh, stormwater management. They have, they don't have easy access. So they don't have enough roads that taking them or moving them out of their area. And that that's another issue of the flooding. Um, so uh, here in this slides, I'm gonna talk about the change in precipitations that really poses challenges in the Midwest, uh, the map here on the on the right is showing in the within like over 50 years, uh, the dark blue color is the change in percentage, which is showing the Midwest and the Northeast Coast also have like a heavy rains, uh, and the increase is uh, about 40 percent or more, uh, and specifically here in Indiana and Illinois within this dark blue color. If we're moving to the chart here showing the water flowing in the streams increased by about 20% in case of uh, heavy rains. Also, the winter and spring uh, precipitation increased by 35%. Overall, the annual precipitations increased in our area by about 15% within the Midwest area. Uh, the 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 map the pictures here on the top showing the flooding when it happened at the Borman when they closed the Borman in 2008 we're still having other issues but it's not as major like before because in that worked in that and they had some stormwater management uh, we see people here on the right all of these pictures from the Northwest Indiana Times and it's showing uh, the disasters and how people. Uh, uh, cannot really handle this big mess. Uh, this map uh, showed that uh, 2021 was the wettest days uh, we have in records and, and specifically uh, extreme rainfall events from coast to coast. The, the dark blue one is showing the record breaking. We are in the top 10 as we show here uh, the, the dark blue color. Um, is specifically in Porter and Laporte County, and that's like they got very wet in 2021. Uh, so what should we do? How to reduce the risk to people and property from future disasters? So the assessment that we are going through today is really important to go through the assessment. So to know if you are really ready for any uh, future disasters or not. And of course, Jen will take you through all of the questions and, and help with us too. So first we need, you know, like this is like a quick plan. We need to assess disasters risk uh, that is common within our area. We have erosion, we have flooding, we have a heavy snow. 
so uh, in the winter uh, and that's something that we need to think about it how if in case of disaster do you know like how can we plan for that so we need to develop mitigation strategy for protecting people and property first of all how to move people how to uh, to get you know the property out of water uh, and and uh, different procedures and strategies in place and once we have that we can adopt and implement the plan so that this is like an emergent disaster plan that need to be in place first and then i'm moving to the next one and here is the picture showing all of the erosions happened within uh, northwest indiana the coastal area either by lake michigan or by a river so this is a real picture happened uh, in the last uh, 10 years so so first as the first step to establish and we already i mentioned that in the the last slide establishing procedures that allow for action in unexpected events and then enhance any hazard uh, mitigation plan if we have a plan in place if we don't have a plan in place we need to have a plan as soon as possible uh, identifying the need for more risk assessment so we're going through the assessment uh, questions uh, uh, today but in like in special cases maybe we need to add and think more about more uh, risk assessment for a specific situations so uh, encouraging community level risk communication and engagement so people has to be aware do you know uh, how to communicate with the disaster department or how to move or how to act do you know in case of uh, disasters uh, developing land use codes zoning and standards that's really important and we going through some of the questions also through the assessment uh, to avoid that and that's specifically of course you know we have already some uh, building uh, uh, within like a, a disaster area or flooding area but with the retrofit redevelopment or a new development we should have these codes in place so people can avoid these uh, risks. Uh, informing long-term community recovery, uh, that's really important. And then the last one is to prioritize and allocating resources. Um, uh, so this is like a just a quick overview about the impact of uh, the uh, like uh, rainfall, flooding, and uh, mud flow. Uh, so I think this is the end of my presentation. And, and I think we're gonna hold the questions to the end uh, once we're done, or if anybody has a specific question, you can ask now. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you, Iman. Um, I would say we do have time for just any quick questions about just kind of why we're doing this. What's the point of this tool? Um, otherwise, we'll go ahead and get into kind of walking you through the, the tool and how to work your way through it. Thank you. Okay, not hearing any questions. Um, I will go ahead and share my screen. Can everyone see my screen? It should show the NERPC website. Yes. Yes. yes? Yep. Okay, just wanted to show you where to find the tool. Uh, if you go to NERPC.org and go to the environment tab uh, under natural hazards resiliency. Uh, so we have some inf background information about the tool, why to complete it, uh, all of this also in the tool, and some suggestions on how to proceed. I did just want to make everyone aware that we do have um, the tool available as both a PDF, a fillable PDF, where you can uh, use drop downs um, and, and fill in boxes there. We also have a printable copy that's that's easier for printing. So depending on how your team wants to approach completing um, this assessment, we do have those two formats available. Um, of course, our contact information is there and we'll talk a little bit more about next steps later. Um, but with that, I'll go ahead and pull up the tool itself. Can everyone see, um, and maybe I can make it a little bit bigger for folks. Can everyone see the assessment tool? Yeah, it's up. Okay, great. I'm gonna make it just a little bit bigger. How's that look? 
OK, so we'll go ahead and just and just walk you through the assessment. This is, as we've said, a self assessment tool for Indiana's coastal watershed communities. Um, I think we are working on revisions without including the word coastal there because we do intend for when we say coastal, we mean the the Lake Michigan watershed in northwest Indiana. Um, so we don't want people to feel that this is just limited to the shoreline communities. This is also for inland communities um, that may be dealing with um, riverine flooding or erosion as well. Um, so this map shows the extent of the Lake Mich Michigan Coastal Program um, boundary. That's not to say if you're in a community in Northwest Indiana outside of that boundary that you can't complete uh, this assessment, but this is sort of the intended target of the assessment. Who should use the self-assessment? I do want to pause on this page. Um, we are not um, envisioning that any one individual within a local government could in and of themselves sit down and answer every one of these questions. This is meant to be um, multi-departmental. Um, we would recommend that your local government uh, form a team to complete this assessment. And so we do have a form here. Um, we have some suggested department representatives that you might want to consult. And of course, every community is different. Um, but these are just some suggested uh, departments that you might wish to consult with or have meetings with in completing the assessment. Um, we do have some blank lines down there at the bottom as well. Um, so that there might be others that um, that you would seek information from in your jurisdiction. And we, we'd love to have that information just so we can add it to our list of people who should be consulted. Um, I will, oh, I, you know, I meant to say uh, we will be taking questions. You know, part of this is to answer all of your questions. I would propose that we're going to go through this section by section, just a very high level overview of what each section entails. Um, if we can maybe just hold questions until the end of each section, and then maybe we can do a call for, for um, questions at the end of those, um, those sections as we work through them. Um, so just wrapping up this this um, section, what's in the self assessment? That's just kind of an overview of what we're going to walk uh, through today, and how to complete the assessment. Just instructions for who to return the assessment to. And with that, I think Joe, were you going to kind of walk people through the natural hazards descriptions? We we have some definitions here. Yep, and these are important definitions uh, for filling out uh, this needs assessment starting on page four. So it's a, it's a page you can always refer back to if you forget. Uh, but we address a couple of different types of flooding, both uh, coastal, so you know communities or county areas uh, along the Lake Michigan shoreline, but also looking at riverine flooding, so inland areas as well. Uh, we address coastal erosion, so once again, uh, along the Lake Michigan shoreline but also fluvial erosion or stream erosion uh, and inland water bodies. Next, we also consider lake level changes on Lake Michigan itself. And kind of a compounding factor to uh, all of these is uh, coastal storms. So uh, we use this terminology uh, throughout the document, the needs assessment. So if you forget, you can always kind of go back uh, to this page to center yourself. So any questions on this little subsection? Yep, and if you have questions, you can go ahead and unmute and ask them or type them in the chat. Joe, I can't actually see the chat directly with my screen shared, so if you'd keep an eye on it, see if we have sure. questions. Sure, let me there. pull that up, yep. All right, nothing said on this one, going once, going twice. All right, let's go on to the next section. Okay. I'll be taking that one as well. All right, so this is uh, uh, page five of the needs assessment, and uh, this is getting at identifying the natural hazard risks uh, within your community uh, or your county, coastal county. Uh, the purpose of this section is to help your team identify what coastal watershed hazards pose the most uh, critical risks. Uh, the team will assign a rating of low, moderate, high, or not, not applicable uh, based on your perception. 
for those hazard issues. So once again, this is a perception level uh, type thing. This is a high level uh, uh, assessment of these risks. It's not super detailed. Uh, there's also a column uh, at the at the end uh, where you can uh, your team could ask uh, questions or make a note uh, if they want to learn more about that particular hazard issue. Uh, so once again, just kind of remember this is a high level review, low, moderate, high or not applicable for each of the hazard issues. It shouldn't take too long to go through this uh, uh, little subsection. Any questions? Any, yeah. And I will point out, obviously, I was meeting with one community that is not a shoreline community, and they realized very quickly, oh, yeah, all of these coastal ones are going to be NA, so it kind of reduces your, <laughs> your work right off the bat. Thank you, Jen. Okay, getting into um, our actual next section of the questionnaire. Um, this is the bulk of the assessment. Um, so e for each of these series of questions, um, they are yes, no questions. We also have options for NA or question mark. If you were using the fillable PDF, these would be drop downs with those options. Um, so we will just go through kind of section by section. You can see the section headers in blue. Um, our idea was just to go through them very high level, um, show you what's there, and then pause at the end for questions. Um, so starting off with uh, understanding coastal watershed hazard impacts, uh, knowing the locations, populations, and properties that are vulnerable to coastal watershed hazards is the starting point to developing resi resilient strategies to reduce risk and avoid losses. So a series of questions here um, related to whether you have identified and document, documented historical um, hazards, um, past hazards, potential future hazards. Um, some questions pertaining to whether or not your um, local government has um, GIS staff, GIS capacity, GIS consultants, um, and kind of how you go about that. Um, access to maps and spatial data. And is your local government aware of risks of contamination um, due to uh, watershed hazards, such as flooding or erosion of infrastructure or contaminated land? So that's kind of it in a nutshell. I'll pause there and see if anyone has any questions about that section or any of those questions. Hey, Jen, if I could add on there is like, so Jen already mentioned like the not applicable from some communities for like coastal uh, flooding. That's true, but don't be put off by putting a question mark. If you don't know, that's valuable uh, for us to understand as well. There's, there's, there should be no, there's no harm in doing so and you shouldn't feel bad about it. If you don't know, you don't know, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yep, and if you don't know, if you have questions, that's a great place, a great use of the comment box um, to fill that in so that as we follow up with you, we can, you know, kind of tailor assistance. Great point. Uh, the next section is hazard mitigation planning, and I believe that Kathy, uh, you were going to kind of take the lead on this section. Uh, yes, so this is. Um, uh, asking you some questions about the status of your multi-hazard mitigation planning um, and how you use it. I had hoped to show you um, FEMA's um, mapping tool where you can actually look on a map and see if your um, multi-hazard mitigation plan is up to date, if it's approved, if it's not approved. Um, uh, these are really important plans, um, not just for because of this project and planning, but they have a lot of impact on type of assistance um, your local government uh, can access from FEMA, um, both planning, uh, mitigation, and also like emergency or disaster response. Um, so, uh, so that's what these questions are. And I know there's other people on this call that actually know more about multi-hazard mitigation planning than I do, but. Um, uh, in the most cases in Northwest Indiana, 
There have been uh, county plans that municipalities signed up on. Um, uh, and so we're asking them, do you know, you know, is that up to date? Are you paying attention to the most recent version? Um, uh, and also, what do you do with it after that? Are you using it in any of your planning processes or decision making um, going forward? And um, especially, I know that previous older versions, NERPC hasn't been involved in this for a number of years. Um, maybe coastal hazards were minimized um, also in the state plan because they only really impact Northwest Indiana, not the rest of the state. So um, uh, that's one of the important questions to make sure things are being cross-linked. Um, I guess that was really all I was going to say about this. Um, I, for example, found it very difficult to find uh, these plans online uh, and to even answer these questions about the region. So that's another um, uh, good point. They have a four or five year shelf life. See, Avash is on here. He knows. Um, and they do have to be updated um, frequently, and they do have to be adopted by local ordinance once they are um, up to date. So if you worked on the county plan, but you didn't adopt it as a local ordinance, um, it doesn't necessarily um, apply to you or gain you access to those federal funds you might want. Does anybody have questions about that? And Kathy, were you going to maybe um, drop the link to the FEMA maps? Yeah. Oh, I thought it was. Oh, it's not in the chat oh, anymore. Okay. Well, it was in the old. Let me. Um, oh, pop it in again. For some reason, the actual maps aren't loading today, but I will show you where you can look it up. And it. I don't know how often. It, according to the website, they update this weekly. Um, can you share it, um, um, Kathy? Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, I can share this my screen too. Sh show it, yeah, on the screen. Um, normally, this page um, has different color coding for whether your plan is um, approved and adopted, um, approvable if it only it was adopted, or out of date. Um, and it and it shows all the jurisdictions and some jurisdictions don't show having any uh, hazard mitigation plan at all. And this is particularly important. The brick um, building resilient infrastructure uh, funding is heavily, heavily reliant on that. You have a multi hazard hazard mitigation plan that's up to date and approved. Um, so. Um, that's why we're asking and we put this in the questionnaire in the tool and it just helps you get an idea of um, where you're at with those. Um, yeah, so it's not showing it right now today, but um, it has every other time. So I'm thinking there's maintenance or something happening. Yeah. Any questions? Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get back into it then. But thanks, Kathy. Yep. Um, again, very important, you know, as we said here, highlighted um, maintain eligibility for federal mitigation assistance grants and, and different programs. So, very important. This is all mostly just mm -hmm. um, pertaining to, as Kathy said, the hazard mitigation mm -hmm. planning, um, the building resistant. Um, resilient infrastructure and communities or BRIC program, mm -hmm. but some different opportunities there. And also the process that you're implementing it. Do you know what it is? And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, last call for questions on that section. Okay, then we will move on to uh, local government planning. Um, Iman, did you want to tackle this section or? Yes, yes. Yep. Uh, um, <clears throat> this is like just checking if you have a comprehensive plan, land use, or any capital uh, improvement and economic development plan that just integrate mm -hmm. within the plan the uh, any strategies or goals uh, to mitigate the the effects of the uh, 
uh, coastal watershed or any like natural hazards that is happening within the area. So in this one, like first they ask uh, if you address resiliency within the agency in general or your local government. And then after that, they are just asking uh, if you also considering any climate mitigation goals and it could be included like you don't have to have like a hazard mitigation plan, but maybe you address that within the comprehensive plan or environmental plan section within the comprehensive plan. So you propose by the end because the comprehensive plans include uh, all aspects like transportation, environmental uh, hazards, uh, economic development. So it could be addressed. So you will maybe find like a number of questions, but like you don't don't have to meet every questions because if you cover it in one, like it could be covered in the land use and is not covered in the any other questions, it's still fine uh, as long as you address that. If not, of course, you, you will assist right away that you need uh, to do that. So that's uh, going through the questions and also public infrastructure, if they consider within uh, buildings or the roads or water and sewer system uh, and other utilities, if you have any recommendation of uh, relocations uh, or protection of mm -hmm. infrastructure that are uh, in risk. Uh, so that's something also for implementation. And, and if you have that already considered. If you have a stormwater management. Uh, so that's for the uh, local government planning, uh, local ordinance is just covering all. If you have any specific ordinance for to reduce natural hazards damages, and also if you are uh, supporting it with any ordinance, sustainable uh, development, um, if you already have sitting like a sit back requirement, especially all of this development uh, near uh, the coastal line or uh, near uh, the the rivers. Uh, so um, that's something that should be also uh, looked at if you have already sit like enough sit back. Uh, and and the other one also, uh, if you're looking at the um, 100 years flooding map and consider that when you're planning for any future plans. So so it's just uh, going over uh, a number of questions. Uh, again, uh, this is like I think planners or environmental planners can answer these questions. Thanks, Iman. Any questions? All right, moving right along then, Joe, I think you were going to handle uh, the next section. Yeah, so next section is uh, titled Implementing Best Practices. It's on pages 12 through 13 of the self-assessment. There's a total of seven questions. Uh, this section primarily focuses on uh, best practices associated with uh, flooding hazards. In particular, it's looking at the community's participation in the National Flood Insurance Program and or uh, the Community Rating System, which offers uh, National Flood Insurance Program policy premium discounts uh, to communities that develop and kind of go above and beyond uh, the requirements of the National Flood Insurance Program uh, to provide protection from flooding. Just a couple example questions uh, from this subsection. Has your local government considered participating in the National Flood Insurance Program's uh, community rating system? Once again, just kind of above and beyond. Uh, and also, has your local government considered relocation or voluntary acquisition of repetitive loss structures or those structures which are at high risk to coastal watershed hazards? Any questions uh, on this subsection? OK, Jen, I believe you're up next with public education and engagement. Yep, thanks, Joe. OK, our next section mm -hmm. moving right along here. I overshot it a little <laughs> bit. Let me go back. 
Mm -hmm. uh, public education mm -hmm. and engagement. Um, so properties can frequently change hands. Uh, this can leave property owners unaware of or unprepared for hazards. On the other side, um, residents and business mm -hmm. owners may have knowledge of hazards that can inform our community's resilient strategies. So it's really important to keep uh, residents uh, educated and um, engaged in the process. Uh, so just some questions here. Does your local government conduct public outreach and education on hazards? Um, do you have information such as maps or guidance on, on practices available upon request? This is a short section. Um, has the public been involved with identifying historic coastal uh, hazard impacts? Um, areas at risk, strategies to address uh, hazards. I know some of your communities may have, for example, a system of tracking, um, you know, flooding complaints. Um, yeah, so any questions on public education and engagement? And there is a question in the chat. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. It's from Victoria. Will assessments be accepted after December 30th if community departments need more time to assemble a team and collaborate on completing the assessment? So uh, it's a great question, Victoria. And to help answer that, I'll go ahead and field that one if it's OK with everybody. So December 30th is kind of like our target. However, uh, the COSTA program is in the process of filing for an extension for our grant funding uh, uh, from NOAA that we can extend the project. So yes, we do, we do see there being an opportunity beyond December 30th. However, that's right now, that is, that's kind of our recommended target. So, but if a community or a coastal county, county needs more time to complete that, uh, they can go ahead and do so. Uh, all I would say is that uh, if you can kind of give us a, a, either a NERPC, uh team member or myself a kind of a heads up, like we're interested, we're forming a team, that would go a long way uh, uh, for us in kind of understanding where people sit on this voluntary uh, 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 needs assessment. Yeah, and I would also add, Joe, you know, um, we will, after we make it through the tool, which we're almost there, we'll be talking about next steps and ways that NERPSI and Coastal Program can com um, assist communities in completing this, this assessment. So, um, you know, I think it'd be a great goal if, if at the very least we could, you know, get in touch with, with each of the communities and see where they are by the end of the year. Uh, yeah, and then be flexible after that. There can't really be a hard, hard, hard deadline on something that's voluntary, right? <laughs> Good question. Any other questions on that section? Okay, I will pass it back to, I believe, Joe. Yeah, yeah I got the next one. All right, so as the name kind of implies for this subsection, it's focused on uh, shoreline and fluvial erosion protection measures. It's on pages 14 through 15 of the needs assessment. There are a total of six questions, but with uh, this section, uh, structural shoreline and fluvial measures are commonly used to protect property from erosion and flooding. To achieve the expected level of protection, these structures need to be engineered, monitored, and maintained and replaced when necessary. This section also includes questions related to alternative hybrid structural options. Uh, you might know these by other names such as nature-based solutions, living shorelines, or engineering with nature approaches, or even non-structural approaches. Example questions that you would see in here might include, does your local government routinely inspect and maintain erosion protection structures within their authority? Does your local government have internal expertise and capacity for maintenance of hybrid structural options? Uh, the reason that we ask that is there has been an increased emphasis of using nature-based design uh, solutions uh, for these. However, once they're put in place, you have to consider how you're gonna maintain them for them to maintain their effectiveness and longevity. Any questions on this one? Okay, uh, hearing none, I am going to turn it over to Kathy, who's going to head up the 
stormwater management section. Oops. Uh, yeah, so this is um, uh, a lot of this is is about um, how do you manage stormwater? Have you incorporated um, potential uh, changes in in storm and rain patterns into your uh, standards? Are you an MS4 community? Um, we know MS4 is about water quality, and this topic is a lot more about water quantity, um, uh, but to what extent your community is integrating that is important for us to know. Um, uh, and uh, how much you use green infrastructure strategies um, to manage stormwater are some of the questions we have. Um, oh, can you do the next page? What your what your planning horizon is for um, that? Um, do you do you have government owned and managed infrastructure, or is it mostly private sector and business stormwater infra infrastructure? Um, and do you have a flood management plan? Um, I think. Do I have natural areas open? Yes, right. You do. Yep. Any questions? Okay. You can chime mm -hmm. in. Otherwise, I think Kathy's gonna. Go into the next section. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and the next question, the next section is about um, the relationship between open space um, and natural land to these coastal hazards, right? So natural areas can absorb the water. Uh, in some cases, your open space and parks you might be used to store water. Um, and uh, do you have an inventory of your open space? Are you uh, aware of how much open space you may be losing to development here and there, because um, that will influence the how much stormwater is generated in the flashiness of your um, stormwater system. So um, that's what these are. It's about um, things things you have. Do you have an inventory? Um, do you include open space in your planning activities? Um, uh, and then. Uh, and also park planning and then a little bit about access. So um, is your access considered resilient if in the case of a coastal hazard, have you lost um, public access facilities or, or are they built to be um, useful in other circumstances? So um, those are ty the types of questions um, in this in this section. All right. Any questions for Kathy on that or the rest of the team? OK. Hearing none, I'm going to go on to the last uh, mm -hmm. uh, subsection of the needs assessment, and this is only going to apply to a few communities. Uh, those uh, uh, primarily along the coastline. The ability of marina uh, facilities to withstand coastal hazards is important to the economic security of uh, communities that rely on them. So a couple of example questions. The first one, does your local government have a public marina? If not, you're done with this section and you're mm -hmm. you're basically done with the needs assessment if you've started from the mm -hmm. beginning and worked all the way down the bottom. Another example question from the section is, does your marina use information related to historic water level trends, mm -hmm. past extreme weather events, and future climate conditions mm -hmm. in facility planning? Any questions on the marina section? Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. And I will just point out we do have um, a final open ended question of additional questions or comments. Please do fill that out. You know, this is a work in progress. Mm -hmm. And so we have a version date on here. We'll continue to revise the tool mm -hmm. and make it more useful and, and hopefully provide you guys with resources. So let's pause there. Any, you know, we didn't have a whole lot of questions going through. Um, I think we have enough time that we can uh, entertain some questions if um, if anyone has them. George, did you have a did you have a question? Okay. 
Okay. I thought I thought I thought it looked like you were trying to say something, but um Okay. Well keep the questions coming. If you think of them, type them in the chat. You can always reach out mm -hmm. to us after the meeting as well. Um but let's go ahead and move on. <coughs> Excuse me. To next steps in resilience, next steps for NERPSI. Um, Kathy, did you want to say a little bit about uh, um, opportunities through NERPSI? Yes, I did. And um, I might share my, um, I might just share my talking points and put them up. Um, so uh, a couple things, a lot of times um, we, have we have surveys and other things for local governments. And, and this time we we're providing um, opportunity for help to complete them. We know that, and that's, well, and Coastal is funding us to do that. Um, you know, some of the communities may have so many departments and staff that they're not sure who's responsible for what. And so if we can help facilitate that discussion um, to open up communication lines um, to help you do the assessment across departments, you know, we're here for that. Um, and you can schedule uh, Jen or Eman or Joe or all of us to come and do that for you. If you're a really small community with hardly any staff at all, um, uh, again, maybe you need a little uh, help and we can point you to federal resources, like the website that isn't working today, um, <laughs> uh, to help you find the answers uh, if you don't know. Um, I think that, um, or we think that some of this information gets lost when administrations change or uh, staff changes. So that's one of the things um, maybe we can help if we have, if help you find information that you may not know where it is. Um, the other thing I wanted to make uh, people aware, uh, if you're not aware, and I know sometimes the some departments aren't aware that uh, NERPSI currently has a, a notice of funding opportunity out. Um, and I said I was going to share my screen and I'm not. And I, um, I do see that Charles mm -hmm. is on uh, the oh. webinar with us. So just if just Charles, mm -hmm. hi, Charles with uh, NERPSI is here mm -hmm. as well. So if you have anything yeah. to chime in, feel free. Um, I was mostly going to just mention Hello. that we <laughs> asked Charles any hard questions, but there are stormwater project funding available um, through the uh, through the NOFA for federal highway funds that um, may be of interest uh, towards this topic of resilience. And we also have a new category called protect, which is for resiliency. And um, that category could be a planning project. So if you you already know all this stuff, you answer this questionnaire in five minutes, you know everything, and maybe you know um, uh, uh, a risk that relates to your transportation infrastructure, your roads or bridges or, um, uh, uh, I don't know, sidewalks that flood or something or um, trails that, that are um, subject to stream erosion. Um, that we can't, you can apply for funds um, through us. Uh, we're still working out whether the planning money would go as a sub grant to us or a direct grant to the community. But regardless, I think you could apply through the NOFA if you have a project. Um, uh, the transportation, there's two pots of funding. Transportation alternatives um, uh, competes with the non motorized, the trails funding. Um, uh, but the protect funding is new, and that is. Uh, solely available for um, um, projects, natural the use of natural infrastructure, construction or modifications to protect from storm surge, flood protection, or aquatic ecosystem restoration related to highway projects, public transportation facilities, um, inter rail facilities, or port facilities. And we have an allocation of about ah, give or take twenty grand, uh, seven hundred thousand dollars a year in Lake and Porter County and um, uh, give 75 to 80,000 in LaPorte County for those type of projects. Um, and we can, um, we have some ab ability to move money around, just general block grants could be used for any of these projects. Um, uh, but these are, these are kind of set, set aside originally to start with. So, um, and those uh, were pub that was published on the 20th and the project applications are, are due November 18th. Um, uh, and these are the fiscal years like we were spread the projects across these fiscal years. Um, I don't know if anybody has questions about that. Um, or Charles, you want to add anything brilliant? 
Uh, no, I don't have anything. If uh, <laughs> if you have any questions, I'd be mm-hmm. more than happy to, you know, shoot me mm-hmm. an email or give me a call. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd be more than happy to to talk with you. Sometimes this comes down to how good you can tell your story because mm-hmm. we're all part of the region. We all want the best projects for the region. So if you have a good project, I mean, mm-hmm. give me a call, give us a call. We can talk mm-hmm. with you about it. Um, and, you know, if it's a really good project and it doesn't mm-hmm. score well, that doesn't mean mm-hmm. uh, it's not going to get funded. So uh, mm-hmm. I tell everybody just to, if you if we can help you tell mm-hmm. the story if you need it mm-hmm. um uh i'm really interested i think that um i don't think we've had planning funds around this topic in the past i think that um some communities have done it like where do your streets flood in in a severe storm or a severe um snow melt where maybe you have a complaint you know where you have to put up those hazard don't drive through here signs um uh and and if we knew where all those places were, you know, those are the kind of places where maybe we want to look at um, some changes and we could, you could use the protect money first to plan or um, evaluate and then follow up with a construction project in the future. Or um, I think that might be the best use of the protect funds. It's not a huge amount of money to do, you know, a gigantic project, but um, uh, good for figuring out a problem. So you uh, have maybe a um, better idea of the solution. We can we can split the funding mm-hmm. between two yep. different groups, so That's two different funding true. pot. Mm-hmm. So we could put what funds we have available mm-hmm. from Protect and then supplement it with a funding mm-hmm. from some other category. Yep. Uh, only local governments, um, OK, I should qualify. Only local governments can apply. Um, for these funds and um, all of the local governments have wait only in the urbanized area Charles correct only in the urbanized area yeah. yes. so there's questions about what's eligible your community probably has a employee and responsible charge that is familiar with our NERPC funding um, and Charles can tell you who that is if you're like a stormwater person or a park person you don't know who in your community um, works on with NERPC on funding um, we can help you find that person. I do see a Laura hand raised. Being see. very helpful, and she added the the link to the NOFA. So thank you. Flo. Oh, good. Thanks. You're welcome. And I see Victoria. Do you have a question? Thank you. Um, thank you for that wonderful um, natural hazards resili- resiliency needs assessment overview. Um, very exciting. I'm really hopeful that Chesterton will put something in. Um, but on my other side, the other side of my life is um, mm-hmm. being the Northwest Indiana Urban mm-hmm. Waters Ambassador. And I apologize. I saw this um, NOFA announcement and looked at mm-hmm. it and wasn't clear on whether or not it was relevant for the Urban Waters Partners. And I see mm-hmm. now that it is. Um, so I'm going to mm-hmm. send out another newsletter to partners mm-hmm. Um, so they are aware of the mm-hmm. opportunity well in advance of the deadline. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was curious if you could provide um, quick examples of um, the different categories, mm-hmm. like special emphasis is on roadway users, carbon reduction, transit-oriented mm-hmm. development, and infrastructure resiliency. Um, do you have like mm-hmm. quick, like two or three word phrases to provide examples to folks on what those types of projects would be? So, yes, these are federal highway funds. And like Kathy mentioned, they're only lim- mm-hmm. they're only eligible to uh, municipalities and mm-hmm. counties. Um, so you'll have to work with your city or your county on getting these funds. Um, and again, they are also only for those who are in the UZA. Mm-hmm. Um, examples would be um, if there's a bridge that overtops or has a has a history of overtopping, um, this would be eligible for if they wanted to redo the bridge. Now, the bridge may not be structurally deficient, but if it floods, then it is a hazard. So doing that, you may want to work with the county on on 
getting that bridge into the system and programming it. Again, your your municipal your maintenance crews probably know where all these uh, flooding areas are occurring because they're ones putting out signs. Um, like Kathy mentioned, they're also mm -hmm. the ones cleaning out the sewers because they're full of, of debris. Um, as far as safety projects, mm -hmm. um, doing anything from um, sidewalks along busy roads, that's eligible. Um, we have several roadway modifications, intersection modifications uh, for safety and for congestion. So that I think is um, those are some examples. Um, um, Charles, there was a question about the UZA maps. They're in the links in the applications, right? Like the map links. Wait, um, I see. Well, I don't know if we have a UZA map. I've been looking for it and I can't find it. So um, um, I'll have to. We'll have do to get that. Around. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking like I'm looking at the air quality one and there's a link to the population environmental justice and facilities map. I'm going to see if the. I don't think the UZA map is in that bundle of maps. Maybe we can continue to kind of look for those and send a follow. Yeah. Yeah. Some folks. And Victoria, I do want to tell you, um, I, you know, I apologize. I should have made that clearer to you. I'm obviously very familiar with your urban water space <laughs> letter. Um, so I will mm -hmm. follow up with you definitely because we would really appreciate that. I think if you can get the word out to your mm -hmm. urban waters partners and, and kind of craft it in such a way that they can see the, the relevant areas. Um, we are at about five minutes left, so you can keep questions coming, certainly, but a couple of things that I think we did mm -hmm. want to share before we conclude. Um, next steps for NERPC on this project. I did want to share that we are planning um, an in-person workshop. Um, this will be held after NERPC's TPC committee meets uh, the morning of November 15th. This workshop will start at 1130 and go until two o'clock. We are it will be at NERPC's um, offices. We are envisioning that this would be sort of a lunch and learn. So if you would like to join us, I'll, I'll send this flyer out to the group as well. Um, but please do either bring a bagged lunch or bring cash and we'll just order Jimmy John's. We'll probably place the order at about 1145 um, once we know everyone's there. Mm -hmm. uh, so the workshop will have a working lunch. Um, we will very briefly go over the purpose and overview of the resiliency assessment, so hopefully that's not too redundant. But then we'll have question, answer, and assistance actually completing the resiliency self-assessment. You can break out into groups that are similar communities, or if you bring a whole team, then your team can use this time um, to go through the assessment with us in the room to provide assist assistance. Um, so you're welcome to RSVP to me at jbirchfield at nerpsy.org. But like I said, I will be um, sharing this flyer out with the group. And um, I also did just want to mention as far as next steps. Um, so NERPSI will be preparing for Lake Michigan Coastal Program a summary report. Our intention is to do one on one listening sessions or maybe maybe it's not one on one. Maybe it's more like five on three. Uh, listening sessions where we sit down with the communities and help you work through um, answer any questions you have or take back any questions that you have that we can channel that information to coastal program. Um, so reach out to us. We'll be reaching out to you certainly to schedule those sessions as you work through the tool. Uh, we will be preparing a general summary report. I do want to make clear that we're not grading or ranking your communities. Uh, that's not the idea of this. We're not going to single you out in the report. It's going to be a general finding of resilience needs in the region. Um, with that, Joe, do you have anything else to add about next steps on coastal program side? Yeah, thanks, Jen. So from the summary report, that is really going to help dictate to uh, the Lake Michigan coastal program on what strategies or tools, technical resources that we need to develop, whether it is like online GIS mapping, uh, funding possibly through our grants program, uh, hosting workshops mm -hmm. to like, uh, the sky is kind of the limit. We're gonna use the feedback from the coastal communities and counties to uh, enhance our uh, program offerings. Coastal hazards and resiliency is kind of a, 
a new subject matter uh, uh, for us or one that we haven't touched on in a little a little while. We are kind of moving beyond uh, where we historically have been of like protecting natural areas and restoring them, but also getting into the vein, uh, obviously, as this mentions, is uh, coastal hazards and building up resiliency within our coastal program area. Uh, so that is basically it for us with Coastal Program and next steps. Uh, this is this is basically a five year project though, and this is we're in the beginning phases of it. So thank you. Which is kind of why the the not you don't know or the question mark is just as important as knowing the answer. Like if you know the answer, we think that's beneficial to you. If you don't know the answer, that helps Coastal know where where we need to work in the future. So it's okay. Yeah. Don't that's what it's for. Jen, if I can, one more thing is like I noticed in our participant list that we had a number of consultants that had hopped on. Uh, I would encourage communities if they have a consultant mm -hmm. that they work with a lot to incorporate them into this needs assessment process to help them answer some of the questions. Or if the uh, some of those firms could also reach out to their communities. And if you think this is useful, I hope you feel it's useful that you can share that this mm -hmm. information or this needs assessment is out there and to uh, help encourage them to participate in this voluntary uh, uh, assessment. That's all I got, thanks. Yep. Thanks Joe, look at that. We made it all through a lot of content. It's 201. Mm -hmm. One last plug I will make is that we are aware that um, some of us are involved in the uh, advisory team for the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Cities Initiative does have um, another coastal resiliency um, program that is occurring right now. They've been reaching out to the mayors mm -hmm. of specifically shoreline communities. So just wanted to throw that out there. If you know if you're getting mm -hmm. messages from us and them, um, just wanted to to let you all know that we are looped into that effort as well. Anything um, else? Oh, a plug, Charles. When is the when is the NOFA workshop? Isn't there one coming up? It is on October 26th. Oh, that's over. Yep. Okay, never mind. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, if you have mm -hmm. any other questions, feel free to stick around. I'm still here, but um, mm -hmm. we will officially conclude the, the webinar at this point. Thank you, everybody.